yeah, I forgot to record, so it's okay. So uh, as I said in this session, we aim to uncover how smart building technologies can be harnessed to enhance energy efficiency, reduce carbon footprints, and improve overall environmental health. We will explore groundbreaking research, case studies, and theories that highlight the role of intelligent design and technology in crafting uh, buildings that are not only efficient, but are consciously aligned with our environmental responsibilities. Uh, so we will for fortunate to have with us a distinguished lineup of speakers whose expertise spans across continents and disciplines. They will share insight drones from their extensive research and their professional engagement, uh, focusing on how smart technologies and strategic design can transform our built environment into sustainable, responsive, and adaptive spaces. In any case, I encourage each of you to engage actively in today's discussion, which is very impressive. Questions, critics, and maybe most importantly, even visions how you can contribute to the evolving landscape through your work and influence. Uh, just, just let us remember opportunity to mold the future of architecture into one the, that respect and respond deeply to the pressing environmental issues of our time, which is very significant that we have to consider. Thank you for joining us at this essential discourse. Let them inspire and be inspired. And I will, I will uh, uh, start to uh, share my screen. Uh, the first, the first uh, research that we have today is the toward an alternative way of thinking and doing the built environment in the digital age, the technological object at spatial agency in interactive space. This is why the PhD candidate, Bakur Fattah, and Dr. Uh, Chogi Ali, PhD candidate, also a PhD candidate, uh, Hamaloy Najdat, to see. Uh, so we will. I will. I will share my screen. Are there any one of them here? Yes. Yes. Good morning. How are you? Yeah. Yeah. So. So I'm going to share my screen. Uh, So share my screen. Just one question. Uh, could you hear the sound properly? Yes. OK, I'm just going to repeat the presentation. And let's start. This is the first presentation.
sir. Uh, I can't uh, hear the sound. Please, uh, could you check the sound? Sorry, uh, is there anyone who cannot listen to the uh, sound? Yes, yeah. sir, we can't hear you. We can't, we can't hear the uh, sound, please. Okay, uh, it is shared. Okay, I'm going to share my screen once again. I think there's a problem here. Okay. Still, you cannot hear? Uh, hello? Uh, anyone could tell me if he, if he can, they can hear the sound properly or not? Yes, yes we yes, can. The problem is still. Okay. No. Uh, please study, uh, which is the Spatial Intelligence uh, Art Center project. Uh, as we can uh, still do the uh, sound now. As an intelligent, uh, as an it's okay now? Uh, build, uh, buildings. Uh, yes, yes, it's okay. As, uh, okay, as, uh, okay. Intelligent uh, buildings. Uh, the design research team of the project has developed various use cases that are classified into three constituent frameworks. These frameworks and to integrate and guide the principle of spatial intelligence in the context of the project. The first framework is the interactive co-creation, which uh, englobe uh, four, uh, uh, four uh, intelligent principles, like talking screen, theater walls, uh, getting our center spatial, and uh, getting our center spatial with the full traffic and analysis. Uh, uh, this image uh, corresponds to the previous uh, intelligent uh, principle. Uh, the second framework is the user location specific content activation, which, uh, which are, are on globe and address uh, the three intelligent uh, principles, uh, which is the see throw and side outside, sentiment projection, pro direction throw activation. Uh, this uh, image corresponds to the previous intelligent principle. Uh, the third framework is the and intelligent navigation, which englobe uh, virtual windows and specify in zero time uh, uh, results. In the results, uh, this the first uh, map uh, show, shows the actor network theory mapping, which is in human and no human uh, accent with, with, the, with their agency, um, corresponding to their wide white in the network. Uh, uh, we, uh, the user, the user is uh, the one of the most important actors with height, white, and height between the and contradiction. According to the Calon, uh, it is called the focal actor. The space also with their uh, important uh, central role and uh, high and high total uh, constraints. Uh, according to Calon, uh, 
uh, it's called obligatory passage point. Uh, this map also shows uh, the density of act, uh, actors and highlights uh, the, the agency and the importance of the technical, uh, technical, uh, technical object in the network. Uh, in which includes sensory, sensory interaction, data, prototype web, augmented reality, application, world projection, interactive projection, interactive screen, and digital archive. Uh, this uh, map also shows uh, the, uh, the principle and the key cluster uh, subsystem in the, in the, uh, the, the, the interactive system network uh, of the case study. Uh, this, uh, this map also shows uh, the eight. Uh, System or clusters in which are the specific, uh, in which are digital interactive solution, the spatial computing, interactive media, and user experience, achieved and interactive learning platforms, interactive digital experience, interactive environment, and application development and smart spaces. Smart spaces. Uh, this graph, uh, graph of correlation uh, we obtain, obtain, obtain the, by analyzing the data. Uh, shows the, the, the key uh, actors or the spokesperson in each cluster of subsystem. Uh, this uh, linear graph of factor network theory shows uh, the key uh, the key mediators in the network, which uh, are uh, uh, 3D prototype web, 3D map, AI application. Uh, this map also shows the boundary object uh, using the fractionalization method of calculation in the both viewer. Uh, we can uh, define uh, the space uh, uh, as a boundary object. Uh, this uh, map uh, also shows the, the uh, influential, influential uh, subsystem or clusters or the important clusters in the, uh, the, in the in the network of our case studies. Uh, we can uh, define the space computing the clusters as the most dominant subsystem within spatial intelligence access and access center project. Finally, uh, uh, we have here a global uh, circular graph uh, uh, of uh, actor network theory, which gives a holistic overview, and another global linear graph of uh, actor network theory, uh, actor network theory uh, of the case study. Conclusion: This study presents a practical application of actor network theory through the mapping controversies method by defining, visualizing, and analyzing the uh, the objective technical object in an interactive space system. Uh, this research relies on how technological impact in human interaction within this uh, space. Smart device provide detailed information on the characteristics of the agency, which can affect, empower, engage, involve, and enable users to take control of their environment. This study also explores the concept of building as living organ organizing, suggesting that uh, with the uh, relevant technology, they can evolve into perspective responses and intelligent entities that engage with users. Uh, the results and the methodology framework of the research uh, can serve as a guideline for architecture in the design process. However, future research can be expanded on this by exploring other interactive spaces such as innovative learning uh, environment. Additionally, future research should address the intelligence in the midst of architecture. Thanks. Okay, uh, we will go to the uh, the next presentation, which is integrating building management system in high-rise structure using building information modeling. This is by Assistant Prof. Dr. Purva Mundar and uh, architect student uh, uh, Schlock Agrawal. I will... Uh... Hello, everyone. Uh, let me share my screen. My name is Shlota Devai. Uh, that sounds okay. And I am honored to stand before you today to present our paper titled Integrated Building Management System in High-Rise Structures Using Building Information Modeling with my co-author Dr. Purva. Imagine a building that knows when to turn off lights and adjust the temperature based on occupancy. 
a building where maintenance tasks are scheduled automatically and potential issues are identified before they become problems. This is a this is the promise of modern building management system. Building automation system or BAS are at the heart of this revolution. They use a sensor and IoT devices to gather data on various aspects of building environment and activities. Imagine sensors detecting which part of the building are in use, allowing the system to make energy saving to make energy saving adjustments to HVAC and lighting system. BAS can even monitor and operate building system remotely, making maintenance and eliminate and administration tasks easier for the building manager. Another technological advancement is the building information modeling. That is changing the way we design and construct buildings. BIM involves creating a digital model of structure that includes comprehensive details on structural and operational attributes. The integration of BIM and BAS is where the magic truly happens. By combining these technologies, high-rise buildings can achieve new levels of efficiency and effectiveness. Imagine using BIM to produce integrated 3D models of tall buildings, including details on building system. This information can then be used to automate HVAC system, generate control plans, and simulate performance, leading to more efficient HVAC configuration and installments. Current research is focusing on further enhancing the integration of BIM and BAS. For example, combining BIM with lightning automation system can optimize energy conservation and lightning, lightning settings for the use of comfort and energy efficiency. This, coupled with parametric design enabled by BIM, allows for automatic changes in lighting layouts based on design elements, further improving energy efficiency. As we can see in the flowchart, there is major seven heads under the building management system, data fire safety, lightning, HVAC, plumbing, security, solid waste management, and acoustics. These heads have their own set of tasks and activities that are controlled using sensors across the heads like the occupancy sensor, thermal sensor, while some of them have very specific sensors involved like the smoke detector, the carbon dioxide detector and many more. This figure shows us the flow of data in the whole building management system. So first the data, so first the sensor detects the data and sends to the local area network. The local area network collects the sensor, the data from the sensors and acts as a portal between the sensor and the central server. The central server collects the data from the local area network, process it and analyze it and test the action. In case of any malfunction of the in the whole process, there is a feature known as the override feature where the user can override the action that is being sent by the central server. Coming on to the framework of the paper, as we know that BIM is currently being used for architectural, structural and MEP modeling. But how about we expand its horizon to further incorporate building management system that will include the lightning control, HVAC maintenance, solid waste management, on-site technical service, water management, mechanical maintenance, security, plumbing and fire detection. This framework will enable us to look beyond the existing way of construction and will revolutionize the way we see the whole industry. To further break down the whole process as to how it will be executed on site, at the beginning of the project from the brief and the requirement, the architect of the project will do the planning, layout and create the BIM 3D model that will be given to the structural engineer for and other consultants to add to their field of expertise to make a 3D the model of structural MEP and HVAC systems. Once these models are created, a clash detection will be run on the combined model to check for clashes in between the MEP systems, HVAC and the structure. In case of clash detection, these models are revised and once again a clash detection is being done. Once the clashes are cleared, the placement of occupancy sensor, security sensors are placed in the model and again the clash detection is run to check for clashes. Once the clashes are resolved, another set of sensors are placed, like the thermal sensor, lightning sensor, temperature sensor, and other. Once all the other sensors are placed, a final clash detection is done to check and resolve the remaining clashes in the project. Once all the clashes are cleared, data of the sensor placement is exported and the project is being executed on the site. 
So, to further understand the framework, a model was developed to develop to integrate BIM and B BMS system. In this building, the basement was used as the parking and, uh, and for other building services like the fire pump room, electrical panel room, tank and other things. At the same time, the control room of the building management system system was also located in the basement of the building of the building. As we can see in figure number five, occupancy sensors are located in the basement as per the sensor range and the use in a particular region. While in the figure number six, we can see how the surveillance of the building is being done through the old way of CCTV. But what if the old and new technique merges? Then we have the sensor-based parking lights. These lights turn on and off once, uh, on and off, on its own once it detects movement, leading to energy efficiency. Energy efficiency and also helps in case of intruder location. As we can see in figure number seven, the placement of parking sensor sensor light in the basement. Figure number eight shows the wiring connection and other connections that is needed for the building management system and the building to operate. At the site level, we have the major issue of access control, for which automatic number plate reader and automatic boom barrier are installed at the entry. And at the same time, surveillance CCTV, camera and sensor-based sensor system lights are being used as shown in figure number 10. At the ground floor, where there is a maximum number of public entering the building, there is the use of RFID readers and face camera readers for access control and to filter out normal general public and the employee of the building by restricting the permission of access. Figure number 13 and figure number 14 shows the other sensor used in the ground floor like the occupancy sensor and the sensor base WB and WC that allows water management system to play an important role. At the first floor, where there is very restricted access, RFID readers and face readers are installed at every door which gives the user flexibility to control the permission of the user entering the building. At this low, since the number of people are restricted, there have been the use of sensor-based lightning system that has been operated by the building management system in the basement, which turns on and off as per the occupancy of the room as shown in figure number 17. Figure number 18 shows the whole building's wireframe model showcasing the thought uh, showcasing the conduits and other violent fissures of the whole intelligent building. <clears throat> In conclusion, the, the integration of building modeling system and building management system offer significant benefits for architectural, engineering, construction sector. By incorporating BMS and BIM modeling, projects can experience streamlined planning processes resource saving and faster decision making. This integration also helps in detecting clashes between building components and automation system, ensuring efficient building design and operation. While this study is focused on assist control and surveillance, further integration of other automation systems like fire safety, a two state HVAC and plumbing holds a promising future for enhancing the overall efficiency and effectiveness of the building management system. Thank you so much. With this, we conclude our paper. Okay, we will go to the other uh, smart housing. Hello, I am Dean Hajjoshkun now. I will talk to you about my study title, uh, Smart Housing from a Disaster Resilience Perspective and its effect on the real estate sector in Istanbul. Academic studies have mentioned smart house when reviewing national and international literature at the intersection of disaster resilience and in architecture and interior design files. Smart homes have become the highly sought after recommendation within the real estate sector. Many projects are marketed under the same smart home label as part of the difference in the automation system they contain. Hence, exploring the reality behind intrinsically popular smart home concept, shaping the real estate market in Curitiba. 
This study aimed to elucidate the impact of smart homes on the real estate sector, which has become a significant component of national and local strategies and action plans within the framework of resilience objective worldwide. This study focused on the mega city of Istanbul, where the Great Marmara earthquake is an anticipated quite soon, and therefore, their house prices are incredibly high for newly construction structures. And the study revolves around the main uh, three main questions. What are the common concepts in contemporary smart home designs? What, uh, to what extent do smart homes fulfill the criteria? What is the influence of the diversity in automation system on housing price? Uh, initially, bibliometric analysis, quantity and search methods was utilized to understand the evolution of smart homes. Later, during the first study, location-based data analysis and semi-structure interview were conducted focus on the selective region and project evaluation the available of diverse uh, automation systems and their impact on housing price in Istanbul. For the literature review architect, uh, articles on smart housing were filtered, the filtered data sets underwent co-occurrence analysis using both wireless software to identify key terms and resolution relationships. Finally, mapping technique work employed to illustrate the entire connection between the examined the co-occurrence analysis and the visual representation of the data. In the file study in Istanbul, this district include Peshikash and Kadıköy, targeting the upper income group, and Kelatine and Maltepe catering to the middle income group that were selected. And from these four district uh, AT projects were selected based on their presentation work sales under the label of smart building and their classification as high-rise structure with more than 10 stories. Curious were generated using GIS for four design of district and upper and middle income group to examine the authenticity of smart house marketing in Istanbul. Two projects were selected as samples from the University of Smart Home project based on their diversity of automation system and comparatively more affordable price within the upper and middle income categories. Same structure interview were conducted with two experts working in each selected two project in technical and sales uh, uh, office and their respective office for confidently purpose to um, study uh, reprofitted project as project A located in Kadıköy and targeted the upper income group and project B located nearby the multiple and targeted in the middle income uh, group. This section classify the result of the analysis into three distinct uh, heading. In the examined conduct for over 80 projects, the smart home automation system used in building were ranked from most preferred to least preferred, as shown in figure four, uh, and 17 housing automation systems were identified in Istanbul. Based on the visualization generated by Postwire, uh, 403 common keywords were identified and analyzed. Prominent keywords and their relationships, such as algorithm cost, service network, feature activity, person patient, and quality project, highlighted interaction among the four fundamental research area information technology, engineer, human, and environmental life. The most frequent using keywords identified were sensor, internet, energy, and security, unveiling the relationship with other sub components of smart home systems. In coherence analysis for distinct cluster have been asserted. Two of these clusters are related to the opportunity offered by the smart home facilities and the systems inherent to smart home. The remaining two clusters are associated with infrastructure and beneficial places. Based on the analyzed work, the facility systems and infrastructure that distinguish uh, homes as smart are determined, uh, as the concept includes sustainable energy saving, efficiency, usage, comfort, provision, workload, reduction, security, establishment, and safety. Smart home automation system encompasses all these concepts can also be remotely controlled and emphasize the importance of energy efficiency. The overlay visualization of the world world from the analysis of academic studies conducted over the year has provided insight to into evaluation of the smart homes concept and its pres present state. 
Uh, open object pricing in the insight diverse from studies and users expectation of smart homes and the uh, definition of the smart home concept in the literature. The characteristics of smart home have been delineated as find in table seven, the facilities, systems and infrastructure and identify to classify homes as smart based on the world examined through the biometric analysis are the presented. Uh, the file study collected data from real estate website and the construction company site for project A and B. In project A, no smart home system is currently ready due to the non-implementation of the anticipated software. In project B, the system has not been informally implemented across all types of apartments and none of the promises system have been deployed. In Turkey, where major earthquakes are expected to building should be made mandatory to integrate early warning system according to Turkish building earthquake regulation. It was found the fire extinguisher system are limited only to place procured by regulation. Hence, it could not claim that smart homes in Turkey primarily preferring for security reasons effectively create resilience against disasters. The same structure interview could not in the past study determine that only some of the systems promised during the project marketing phase actually exist in pr uh, practice. Uh, consumers were unable of this situation. After examination smart housing project in Istanbul, it has been discovered that smart homes have diverged from their original purpose and component became instead object of conception of stumble of uh, societies for the upper and middle income group in society. Like the file study categorized smart homes based on their home automation system would facilities more informed decision and mindful conception. Uh, since home automation device already possesses the certification, establishing smart home certification would allow uh, for objective evaluation and assessment. With smart home certification in place, more dependable outcome uh, could be expected in meeting user expectation and price in the real estate market. Future studies on smart homes uh, should strive to identify the additional benefits that smart homes could provide users in cities where threats such as earthquake, global warming, climate change, and security are rising and resilience is becoming increasingly crucial. Furthermore, proposing new inspection system for identified definition and errors and develop an objective assessment system to enhance access to smart homes for different income groups should be key objective of future research on smart house. Thank you for listening. If you have any question, I will be here to answer. Okay. It's uh, smart homes. Okay, let's go to the uh, last one effect of building materials on sustainable facade design. Hi, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Sheyda. Today, I will present to you my article, which is called EN0259, about the effect of building material on sustainable facade design. Today, I will discuss a topic that lies at the intersection of artistic innovation and sustainable facade design in architecture. From, earliest, from the earliest human settlement to the sprawling metropolis of today, architecture has been the canvas upon which humanity has painted its aspirations, values, and ingenuity. And at the forefront of architecture expression, standards of facade. The outer face of building that not only shuts us from elements, but also serves us reflection of our collective identity. Architecture, which must accurately reflect cultural and technological development. At all stage of civilization is very exciting as it is the most concrete image of human history in this presentation the, fa the facade design will be focused on four main topics first of all facade design before the 
Industrial Revolution. Secondary, facade design after the Industrial Revolution. Then, sustainable facade design with today technology. Finally, sustainable facade design with future technology. Human beings have been trying to create space since ancient times. Architecture is the art of creating a space. It reveals the cultural, economic, social, technological, and intellectual reality of society. Throughout history, designers and builders have tirelessly experimented with materials and techniques to create facades that not only endure but also inspire. From the humble adobe bricks of ancient civilization to the towering glass skyscraper of modern cities, the evolution of facade design mirrors our society, marked by process, innovation, and adaptation. Architecture starts before the age of enlightenment, less for centuries without need for new construction techniques on existing materials. Change in, change in structure occurs toward formal search rather than technological searches. In the 19th century, new buildings type were needed due to migration from villages to cities due to production and compression. Due to the wars, there was a housing defect that could not be met with the traditional construction method. Development in materials and techniques have industrial concretion, resulting in factory products, gaining promising. New materials such as iron, glass, and concrete become the building elements of new age. But as we stand on the principle of new era, characterized by unproductive environmental changes, the role of facade design takes on new significance. The improve for sustainable has complete architecture and engineers to reimagine the very founding of building design. Intrinsic principle of energy effective resource conversation and environmental starship. In this pursuit of sustainable architecture, facade emerges as a critical battleground. It is here. In the interface between built environment and the natural world, that we have the opportunity to make a profound impact through the adoption of smart materials, advanced technologies, and biometric principles. We have the power to transform facade from positive structure into active against change. Example of sustainable facade, consider for example, the Al Bahar Towers in Abu Dhabi. Where photovoltaic cells embed in the facade harness the power of the sun to generate clean energy, or BIQ building in Germany, where LGA filed panels profit water and produce biomass, reducing carbon emulation in the process. These are not just buildings, they are testament to the transformation potential of sustainable facade design. But our journey towards sustainable does not end here. As we look into the future, we must continue to push the boundaries of innovation, exploring new frontiers in material science. Biotechnology and digital fabrication projects like the LIDPAD, a visionary ecosystem floating on the waters, showcase the potential of biometric architecture to create environments that are not just sustainable, but designable. In this table, process of building illumination from Châtelet to Lilipet in terms of changing facade materials of the buildings and its effects on the buildings are seen. In conclusion, the facade is more than just a surface. It is a symbolism of our commitment to building a better world. As architects, 
engineers and citizens of this planet. We have responsibility to ensure that our buildings not only reflect our values, but also embody them. Through sustainable facade design, we have the power to shape power to shape future that is not only beautiful, but also resilient, inclusive, and sustained. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Uh, uh, sorry for this. <laughs> okay. Uh, any question? Uh, I think this, this is time for the questions. Uh, do you have any question about uh, the uh, research that you have done so far? Is there any 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 question regarding the uh, first first uh, research which was toward an alternative way of thinking and doing the built environment in the digital age? Uh, I hope that one of the uh, PhD candidates or the doctor uh, Chu Wai or candidate uh, Hamlui Najed, if I'm spelling it correctly. Yeah. Uh, any question here? Uh, honestly, I have a question here. Uh, I, uh, I, my question is the uh, for the first research, which is toward an alternative way of thinking and doing the built environment. Uh, this one, the uh, uh, the researcher that used this uh, ANT, which is the actor network theory. Uh, my question is related to the uh, uh, what is the relationship between. Uh, actor networking theory and agent-based modeling. Uh, since they are talking about uh, actors and those actors normally, uh, the, the factors that affect those act actors are not static, it's dynamic. So my first question is what, wasn't it better to use agent-based model? What was the reason to use INT? Uh, anyone of them is here to? Yes, yes. Uh, hello, good morning. Yeah, good morning. Uh, yes, there is uh, an, an uh, holistic or uh, or uh, big relationship be between actor network theory uh, uh, the, for uh, Bruno Latour and uh, agent buzz modeling. Uh, yeah. But uh, but I think that the actor network theory is uh, more holistic across the. Uh, than uh, agent buzz modeling because actor network theory uh, it, uh, it treats uh, the social issue and the technical issue at the same time in a symmetric in, in the symmetrical way and at the same time but uh, agent buzz modeling uh, it uh, focus uh, more on uh, the, the, the technical actor okay okay uh, then I have another question which is I'm interested <laughs> I was interested in this research uh, you showed some some uh, heat map for the connection between the uh, actors, and I'm just wondering what what sh those map based on the centrality of some actors. So I was just uh, curious to know because I was not sure about the centrality actors based on what, because if it is density or it is connection or it is betweenness or it is closeness, I didn't get I didn't get it from the the. Uh, the uh, the uh, image uh, since it was uh, it was done very fast so I, I appreciate if you provide a, a, a clarification on this yes thank you for your interesting question yeah uh, this uh, this software or uh, this map is based on the network analysis software like uh, was viewer uh, raw graph this software allows to, to map uh, the actual network theory there is no uh, fixed method to uh, to visualize actor network theory, but there uh, there are uh, various methods. Uh, 
uh, uh, the, uh, our method that we uh, use in this uh, in this research is uh, the buzz on vote viewer uh, because uh, it allows to uh, visualize the uh, network analysis. This network analysis software uh, allows uh, to to show or visualize networks of actors based on their uh, occurrences, based on their text occurrences, and uh, based on the uh, total links to strength between the actors. Uh, for example, uh, uh, when we uh, take a text, when yeah. we uh, take a text, the the the, the software, uh, uh, the, the calculation of the software based on the occurrence of the words in the text. Yeah. Because yeah. This we we we, we uh, use so, this. Uh, so it is based on the connect uh, on the viewers. You said it's connection. Yes. Because number of the connections. The total strength of connection and the coherence words in the text. Yeah. So what if if you have two persons that they don't have much connection, but they are very important to connect to each other. Yani if you have two groups, for example, like here, two groups. Uh, for example, one group here, it, they have too many connections, the other group too many connections, but there is one link here, one link here, which doesn't have many connection, but it is just connection connected to the other group, like it is, has one link, one link. So in, in case of networking, I think, which, which we call it betweenness, betweenness. Yes. Yes, so uh, I, I, I think a term of it in networking, this is very significant to show because this is also, these links are very important uh, between, it is, they, okay, they don't have connection, but it's still they are very important to connect the whole network together. Yes, uh, it's very interesting uh, idea. Uh, this is called in that network theory, boundary object. Yeah. Well, yeah. Boundary of object, uh, uh, it uh, it is a betweenness between uh, one or more than one cluster, okay. or subsystem. Okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank I you. think uh, there is a question. Yes, uh, yes, you can go, Doctor uh, Schlott. Hello. Yeah. Actually, there seems to be a problem on the side of Dr. Udo. So he has a question towards the first presentation. Okay. That what do they mean by when they say a better life or a good life? Well, with sustainable design, uh, life quality is uh, gonna get better, and. This is gonna be better life for users and all the uh, all the people around the world. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any any question? You are muted, uh, Doctor Shada. You are made muted. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, 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 it's okay. Any more question uh, here? Um, honestly, I have another question, but I want to give a space to the audience here to ask their questions. So if there is no question, I will ask one last question to the last uh, 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 research, which was sustainable uh, effect of uh, building materials on sustainable facade. Uh, yeah, Dr. Shada, you are. Yeah, <laughs> you mentioned Al Bahar Tower. Uh, okay, it's it's a nice it's a nice tower, which is in Abu Dhabi, I think. Yes. Uh, but I am always cu was cu very curious about those type of buildings, since we are talking about the sustainability, and I know there is a low low cost and the uh, uh, the cost of the initial cost and the running cost for such buildings. But I always was asking. Do you think this this Al Bahar Tower really is a sustainable building? Because mm -hmm. when you think to this type of technology that have, they have used the facades for moving the facades and those things, I think it was possible to make it if we are using the term sustainability. Mm -hmm. I think it was possible to make it in less cost with less material, with more proper material. Don't you think it was just for? 
I just want to understand this. If this type of building is real, real really, we can call it a sustainable building. I agree with you. Uh, there's a two uh, think about this. Uh, one way, uh, it's uh, cost very much and it's also not uh, available for all around the world. So we need to uh, get, uh, and then we try and get them in Abu Dhabi or Turkey or another place because a uh, uh, carbon footprint for this uh, way, it's not sustainable. Yeah. But another way, like Abu Dhabi, uh, oh. it's handled cooling and warming and very different ways. Uh, so, and that way it's sustainable and uh, high technology, but for uh, cost and uh, the way we can use them, the way we can get them, it's not sustainable. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's remind me of using bamboo in some countries. Uh, it's bamboo itself is a su sustainable materials, but yeah. if you are gonna to import it from, for example, from Thailand to, or China to our country, the cost of bamboo will be more higher than to use some other material that which is available in your country. So yes. this is my question. That was my question. Really, I, I, I have been there for more than 10 years and I know the, their climate and their, uh, their, their, uh, the, the, the atmosphere that they have. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shaida. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your answer. Uh, any, any other question? We still we have one minute. Okay, if we don't have, uh, if there's no question, we will go to uh, uh, the other research, which is the promoting sustainability in Bahraini primary healthcare centers. I think this is very interesting. So, uh, let me share my screen. I think it's shared. You can hear the sounds properly. We can hear us. Yes, we can hear you. Tom. Your screen is not shared yet.
Hello, Dr. Mustafa. Yes. Um, we, we can't see the screen yet. Uh, sorry, we've been writing in the chat, but uh, I, I think you, you haven't seen it. We can't see the screen or, or can we hear the presentation? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Sorry, sorry for this. Uh, it's okay. Yeah. I think we should go back. I should, I should go back. Rainy, Can yes, we can see it now. Framework for environmental responsibility. Healthcare buildings are responsible for approximately 4 to 5 percent of global greenhouse gas emissions, and a hospital in the US is also known to generate approximately 7,000 tons of total waste on a daily basis. Despite this, the healthcare sector has the potential to significantly contribute to reducing its ecological impact and addressing climate change to advocate for a healthier future. However, there is limited awareness on environmental education and training. The aim of this study is to outline strategies for cultivating a culture of sustainability within primary healthcare centers in Bahrain, promoting occupants' environmentally responsible behavior and consequently reducing the ecological footprint of buildings. So we start off by a literature review, followed by understanding the current condition of primary healthcare centers, followed by the perception of occupant behavior. Uh, and finally, a proposed framework that offers valuable insights to stakeholders and serves as a roadmap for promoting a culture of sustainability. Sustainable development is such a popular concept nowadays. It's multifaceted, it's multidimensional, and despite its varying dimensions and, and definitions, it's become such a necessity within design and within the realm of architecture. Many countries are actively aligning their efforts with the sustainable development goals. However, the building sector has been relatively slow. There's still this gap between understanding the goals and implementing them, especially within the assessment tools of green buildings. The term sustainability has also become very popular within the healthcare sector, as healthcare buildings have a significant environmental footprint through energy consumption and waste generation. And therefore, it's really important to look at these sustainable healthcare buildings or green healthcare buildings and try and understand how they can promote sustainability. And this is done through green practices, you know, non toxic environments, green cleaning, waste reduction. Um, and it has several benefits, such as expedited patient recovery, it leads to shorter hospital stays. However, there are many challenges to implementing these different elements within buildings. And occupant behavior is actually one of them. It's, it's significant in decreasing natural resources and minimizing environmental impact. However, there's a lack of awareness about how this is achieved. Now, we can see that there are many green building rating systems in place, going all the way back to the 1990s. And these systems provide a framework for healthy, efficient green buildings Currently in Bahrain, we have 33 LEED certified buildings. However, we still don't have a national rating system. And there are many barriers of implementation, such as high cost, having LEED brain, being static systems, uh, and it lacks focus on environmental behavior. It's a missing element within these green building rating systems. Bahrain is heavily focused towards moving towards sustainability and having these green initiatives, and we can see a lot of them already in place. For example, Bahrain's government plan, which was placed in 2019, uh, Bahrain's green building code, the environmental laws, uh, Bahrain's national vision 2030, and finally the net zero emissions by 2060. And although all of these are in place, we can still see there's a gap of occupant behavior to address sustainability issues. And occupant behavior can actually affect energy use by 4%. So we need to make sure that this is aligning with the green initiatives. And research also highlights the importance of having a culture of sustainability in order to enhance environmental responsibility. And this can be driven through behavior, which drives performance and transformative change. 
So to summarize all of that, occupant behavior is seen as such an important factor in sustainable buildings, and it holds such an immense significance in achieving an organization's environmental objectives. So you can see that there are many factors that influence or enhance environmental responsibility and promote sustainability within the healthcare industry. And these include the Sustainable Development Goals, having green design, uh, having national initiatives set in place, green building rating systems, a focus on occupant behavior, and having appropriate management with the goal of achieving environmental responsibility. Now we can move on to the data collection and we can see that the first part is uh, the in-depth interviews and the purpose of this is to understand the current state of primary health care centers and the extent to which sustainable strategies have been implemented. Um, this was conducted between uh, December and January uh, 2024 uh, through phone interviews. Uh, with specialists and experts from the Ministry of Health in Bahrain, and the findings confirm that primary healthcare centers in Bahrain have already started implementing sustainable initiatives in line with the Vision 2030 and the UN's SDGs. Just as a point of clarification, during the interviews, it was made very clear that the research is on primary healthcare centers because the statistics and indicators differ between hospitals, primary healthcare centers, and public health centers within the country. The findings from the Ministry of Health interviews confirm that there are many sustainable strategies in place, some of which have already been implemented at certain hospitals and primary healthcare centers. The results highlighted that there is a pressing need for awareness and a behavioral shift towards greener practices and a culture of sustainability for the implemented strategies to truly achieve their intended effectiveness. As for the second part of the data collection, it involved a questionnaire which was conducted online and the purpose of this was to assess the perception and awareness or the factors influencing comfort and strategies towards a culture of sustainability. And we have a total of 173 valid responses. The findings from the questionnaire underline the widespread awareness of green buildings and the willingness to participate in environmental programs and initiatives. And it emphasizes the importance of early integration of sustainable education. The results from the SPSS analysis uh, show that neither gender, age, nor frequency of the visit are statistically significant or have an impact on the perception of green buildings, uh, their ability to impact well-being, or on the selection of strategies that promote sustainability. Based on the data that's been collected and the analysis of the findings, a framework has been proposed for environmental responsibility, and this is to promote sustainability through enhanced occupant behavior, and the strategies are categorized by either physical context, which is the green design, or the structural support, which is more managerial. For the physical context, um, we are suggesting alternative transportation, having local trees on site, the integration of green technologies, and having architectural environments that increase opportunities for environmentally responsible behaviors, such as educational signages, uh, local materials, recycling, and so on. And when it comes to the structural support, it looks at leadership, management, collective efforts, having policies, uh, green building rating systems, national initiatives in place, and finally providing environmental education and training. So in conclusion, the results highlight different strategies related to the physical context and structural support to improve occupant behavior. And the findings also help develop a framework to promote sustainability through environmental responsibility. And the study's translational nature can be extended to other healthcare buildings and offer valuable insights to drive policy level change through environmental awareness. The results of the study offer valuable insights to stakeholders, providing them with a roadmap for fostering a culture of sustainability. Um, there are a few limitations which are acknowledged in this uh, research, which are the sample size may not rep represent the entire population, and further detailed studies of specific centers are required. So future research can look at identifying specific primary healthcare centers which require targeted interventions based on their energy usage and function. Thank you all.
Thank you. Uh, Thomas Edison, the great inventor. Uh, we will go to the other uh, impact of uh, built environment on student social and cultural sustainability in educational campuses. Please let me know if you can see the uh, screen and the sound properly. Hello, I'm happy to be here. This is Dunama Saadat Madaki, a student of Khan University. Permit me to stand on the already existing protocol. The title of this paper is The Impact of the Built Environment on Students' Social and Cultural Sustainability in Educational Campuses with Istanbul Okan University as a case study. Um, educational facilities house different variety of people. It could be from different nationalities, different ages, different personalities. And by nurturing vibrant, inclusive spaces, students are empowered to thrive, connect, and leave an indelible mark on the fabric of their educational journeys. Therefore, this, uh, this research paper aims to investigate and understand how the built environment within the educational campuses influences the social and cultural sustainability of students. It also um, aims to clarify the complex relationship between spatial design architecture and long-term viability of educational facilities, and also examine how physical spaces influence social dynamics, cross-cultural interactions, and campus lasting legacy. The materials and methods that will be employed during the course of this research are a mixed method approach which involved reviewing of existing literature, analyzing a case study of existing campuses, and a user survey of some Oka University students. The, the, the research questions that are going to be addressed here are social interaction. How does the built environment influence the student's social interaction? Cultural sustainability. To what extent does the physical environment con contribute to the cultural sustainability of students? And lastly, the students' preferences. This is also very important, a very important point. We have to know the preference of the students. What preferences do students have regarding the campus for size? After all the investigations were done, were, were done results were gotten. Now we'll speak about the user survey. The user survey included 61 Oka University students, which varied from different national, nationalities and of different um, category of in their educational lives. Some were of postgraduate, some were of, in their undergraduate, and some stayed on campus, some stayed off campus. So we had to have we have in order to get a generally acceptable result, we had to um, involve students of different kinds of categories put their ideas together and come up with a solution. So the students shared varied, varied ideas concerning their perceptions, experiences, and preferences as regards the educational facilities built environment. Some students like to spend their leisure time in indoor spaces, while others prefer the outdoor spaces. When they were asked about how the, the, the facade of the building, of the, of the building, the built environment affects their mood, a large percentage of them felt, wow, yes, 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 this really affects our mood. The way the built environment is presented affects our mood. Why a, a, a minority of them felt no, they were indifferent about it. And they were secondly, they were also asked how they, they interact culturally, if they have maybe during their stay in the campus, have they have they been able to come, um, interact with people of various cultures? A lot of people were, were affirmative. Yes, 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 but a little percentage, about 20%, said no, they have not. So I think that may have to do with the kind of person, individual they are. Then they were also asked how the campus facade, the campus environment, how if they feel connected to the campus environment when they are on campus. 
Yes, about 76 of them said yes. They actually feel uh, um, um, connected to the campus, while about um, 30 or, or, so, or there about percent said no, they don't feel connected to the campus. And those, the, the participants were also asked if they, they could um, recommend if the, uh, a, a, a facility, an educational facility, educational campus to people, to others, based on the facade, and the majority of them were affirmative. They were like, yes, 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 we, we recommend it to people. Once it is it's a very comfort, comfortable and it meets up to all our expectations, the facades are good and meets up to all our expectations as students. Yes, yes, why not? We, we are going to encourage them. And the, um, from the from all the results and the research, we have come to realize that the campus environment surpasses may may just surpasses major the physical construction. Research findings reveals that from the users of it, we realize that yes, the build it affects their. Once everything's perfectly organized, I'll start working on my thesis. Welcome to this tutor. Uh, I think it's finished the uh so yeah it is done. It is done. Uh thank you. We will go and it needs we will go to the other the other one which is an overview of the solid waste management scenarios in urban residential settlement in India. Hi everyone, my name is Nilofa. I'm an architect and academician by profession. I'm pursuing my PhD from School of Planning and Architecture in New Delhi, India, into the area of solid waste infrastructure in urban residential settlements. Today, I'm here to present my work with my guide, Professor Vanna Jha, on the topic on an overview of solid waste management scenario in urban residential settlements in India. So just give me a moment. Let me share my screen. Yeah. So I will start my presentation with my paper and abstract, which aim to conduct a systematic literature analysis of the current state of solid waste management in uh, Indian urban residential settlements, identifying challenges, gaps, and potential solutions. India's Urban waste management system are causing showers due to population density, insufficient and lack of infrastructure, and segregated waste, improper collection and disposal, which posing environmental and public health risks. It is found that income significantly impacts solid waste content, with low to middle income individuals producing organic waste, more in quantity, whereas high income individuals producing dry waste like paper, metal, and glasses. And interestingly, a correlation has been found which exists between geographical positions and economic state of the waste characteristic or of composition. The paper concludes the urgent need for adequate infrastructure, effective treatment, and recycling strategies to solid waste, emphasizing composting as the most environmentally friendly method. Therefore, public perception, willingness to pay, clear laws, social community activities, and regular public campaigns are pillar of effective solid waste management. So, why does the need of the study? So, as for many authors and research, it is found that 77% of the waste generated in India is dumped in open dump sites, 18% goes composting, 5% for recycling. Therefore, there is a lack of collection, segregation, recycling, and disposal. Improper waste management and handling from transfer stations and landfill. The reduced expenditure on hauling small quantities of waste into regional facility transfer station may be established. Whereas in 2016 laws, um, the bulk waste generator, the generators who generate more than 100 kg per day, it is mandated that waste generated by these generators be treated and processed within the premises, with residual waste being distributed to local agencies. Also, it is found that as after collection, the wet waste composition is sent further to composting plants or disposal that are at a distance from the urban local bodies or the site of waste generation, which increases the transportation costs, avoided energy, carbon footprint, and manpower, as well as in handling and transferring waste from one place to another. Inappropriate waste management raises greenhouse gas emission, and unconnected waste has a harmful effect on health and environment, which results in declining quality of life. Whereas SDG Goal 11, it indicates that by 2030, reduce the adverse per capita environmental impact of cities, including by paying special attention to air quality and municipal and other waste management. So I have used a PRISMA method for my systematic review. So I chosen the keyword municipal solid waste management, treatment and disposal, infrastructure, environmental health. And also during the research was found that there was a major shift from 2015, 2018, 
till 2021, like there was a boom into the area of waste management um, globally and also into the Indian scenario. Now coming to my aim, to study the solid waste management scenario in urban residential centers in India. And the objectives are to study the present solid waste management practices in India. Second, to identify issues and potential areas related to solid waste management based on zero waste concept in the existing built environments of authorized to plan residential settlements. Now, starting from the global scenario, so the world generates 2.01 billion tons of solid municipal solid waste annually, with at least 33% of that not managed in an environmentally safe manner. So, waste generated per person per day weighs 0.74 kilograms, but ranges widely from 0.11 to 4.54 kilograms. So, it is found that region with high income countries, North America, Europe, and Central Asia, generates about 34% or 63 million tons of the world's waste. Daily per capita waste generation in high income countries is predicted to increase by 19% by 2050 compared to low and middle income countries. Whereas, as countries rise in income level, the quantity of waste cyclable in the waste stream increases, such as paper increasing more significantly. Food and green waste compromise, uh, comprise uh, more than 50% of waste in low and middle income countries. So, if I talk about the global waste disposal scenario, 37% of waste is disposed of in the landfill, 33 goes for open dump, 19% in goes material recovery through recycling and composting, and 11% is treated through modern incineration. So, the best examples, uh, if you talk about in terms of waste management, so so, so the practices are circular economy. Of course, Copenhagen's goes at the top because they have a vision for 2024 to recycle 70% of their waste in terms of resource and waste management plan 2024. And then the zero waste, which mandatory recycling and composting in San Francisco, US, and Australia, and uh, uh, many more. So there is also found a three-year model towards reduce, reuse, and recycle mostly towards Japan and South Korea. So if I talk about now to the Indian scenario, so we have Policies started like uh, uh, which majorly come in effective mode as 2016 uh, solid waste management tools, plastic waste management tools. Then we have uh, a manual from uh, MOHUA, and then the Swatch Bharat mission comes in 2020, um, 2014, uh, which is October, in and uh, with a drive called Clean India by ensuring cleanliness and sanitation, taking care of both solid and liquid waste. And uh, after that, there was a gradation in this theme of Swatch Bharat in 2019, which was known as Urban 2.0. And uh, now coming to the scenario of India, it says that January 2020, there was 1.7313 metric tons of waste generated per day from 84,475 watts. And it was found that per person or the per capita is 450 grams per day, and it's, it's increased by 1.3% annually. Maharashtra generated the most with 22,002 uh, uh, metric tons per day, which is from 7,322 watts, while second generates the least with 89 metric tons per day from 53 watts. And among the Union territories, it was from Delhi generating the highest amount of waste, which is 10,500 metric tons per day, whereas the demand in due is at lowest. So now um, coming to the uh, uh, the dump sites, like so India still has 3159 operation dump sites, and Uttar Pradesh leads with 609 dump sites. Now coming to the technology practices, so basically uh, the technologies for reclaiming dump sites, the first one is biocap, the dump site, and the second is biomining and bioremediation. So capping is not the first option in order to prioritize for environmental safe legacy waste management, capping should only be considered for a maximum of 10% residual waste extra after biomining of stabilized waste. In comparison to capping, biomining is a less expensive method for getting rid of garbage hills. So uh, the if I talk about Swaj Bharat Mission 2.0, so it's emphasized on source segregation and processing waste, which is biodegradable and non-degradable. Then uh, only inert waste and processed projects unsuitable for biodegradable or non-biodegradable waste management, not more than 20% of the total waste may be sent to landfill. Now, uh, if I talk about Swachh Bharat Mission, it has a focus on circular economy, a strategy towards material recovery and reuse, a way towards eco-friendly, because it will require the complete reutilization of material and eliminate waste. So this is how the hierarchy goes from prevention to disposal. And uh, I mean, of course, an economic system that replaces the end-of-life concept with reducing alternative, reusing, recycling, recovering material and production, distribution, and consumption processes. So as I said earlier, Copenhagen is the one which is a great example, especially when you talk about circular economy. Now. So there was an assessment done in 2018 to 2020. So by this report, it was found out that there were different parameters like source segregation where uh, the cities like Indore, Panaji, and uh, Leeds, but in terms of biodegradable waste management, there's Masuru, Bangalore, and <clears throat> Bobbili Leeds, where uh, in the different umbrellas of material processing, Bhopal, Surat, Dimshades were, then the plastic waste management, Bangtok, uh, Kumbakunam, <clears throat> and then your, uh, it's a long list. I mean, it, it goes on. So as I'm saying that the source segregation, you can see over here that how they have different compartments for their source segregation. Then again, the bio degradable waste where they're talking about the composting, then the material um, processing, then how they are upcycling or reusing the material, then plastic waste management, like how they're segregating different topology of plastics 
in, in the area of Goa, Sikkim, and Tamil Nadu than the construction the demolition waste like Delhi and Durugram, which is really, really uh, working hard with the construction demolition waste. And it's also leased in uh, sweat reduction um, assessment. Now, in terms of sanitary waste, it is Pune, uh, um, Maharashtra. Then uh, if you talk about innovative models, there is Odisha model, there is Maharashtra and Kerala, which is majorly focused on decentralized and community-driven model with micro-composting centers and material recovery facilities. So whereas it was found out that Leon Panaji, the popular tourist destination, produces significantly more waste than the national average of 0.3 to 0.5 kg per person. So, so after coming uh, with all the literature, there was a finding and observation in terms of environmental, which was find out that composting, recycling, and incineration option to integrate the solid waste management approach significantly reduces the carbon uh, emission or greenhouse gas emission. Composting is more uh, um, uh, environmentally friendly method to reducing greenhouse gas emissions in terms of economy, creating venues for the circular economy for recovering and recycling material. In terms of organizational improvement, in terms of required resources and infrastructure, you will be often lack proper infrastructure and constraints, strategic and environmental and uh, institution problem, including limited capacity, financial constraint, and political will. Then the governance of the policy, so there should be clear laws, social community activities, regular public campaigns, and key methodology, which are, um, um, again, a strong pillar for effective solid waste management. So as a geo administrator, there should be uh, a solid waste composition, like as we all know, by, by income with low to middle and um, uh, uh, high income. So uh, it's, it's, it is interestingly found, as I said, mentioned that there's a correlation between geographical position and economic status with waste characteristic of the composition. And also it's taken as a consideration to um, um, implement the uh, life cycle assessment model to select appropriate waste management algorithm to evaluate and find a suitable solution. So uh, the social culture, again, the public perception and an effective plan towards selection, segregation, processing of solid waste and the management, which talk about from collection to the disposal, of course, the, um, your collection plans, your route maps, your vehicles, which are you using, and of course, the processing, the, the technology. So it is found that composting is an economical, sustainable, and environmentally friendly method of processing organic waste. So uh, again, coming to the um, 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 a need of infrastructure, so there was a research done by one of the NGOs, it says that we cannot continue to add more waste to these landfills. The market plan should allocate localized waste management center for people to treat waste within their locality. So yes, there is a need. Now, if I try to, um, yeah, so to sum up my gap identify in terms of global policies and regulations and manual, it was found that in terms of waste sector at urban local level, there is no um, guidelines or law which talk about site requirement selection capacity in terms of ergonomics, in terms of like high clearance flowing, roofing or waste infrastructure towards parking or the vehicular um, and roadways. So there is no guidelines on site roadways, swing and parking in terms of waste treatment spaces like infrastructure recycling and composting. There is no um, guidelines or law which talk about existing delays like electricity to operate equipment, sliding, water for facility, cleaning, restroom, and drinking. So therefore, there's no effective guideline for waste infrastructure at the urban local level these days or so far in India. So just to um, uh, come to the conclude uh, uh, the remarks or the discussion and conclusion. So previously, just found that most of the studies were focused or themed were based on solid waste management, treatment technologies, LCA tools, addressing health and environmental effects, stakeholder roles, GIS for environmental impact assessment. But due to lack of improper waste management, and infrastructure at the ULB level, it has found that urban local bodies face challenges such as inequality, infrastructure, limited capacity, financial constraint, and political win. Improper solid waste management can pose environmental and health um, risk, improvement in terms of educate or required resources and infrastructure. Also, ULB struggle to handle the massive amount of solid waste generated by rapidly rising population. Therefore, there is a need to establish waste processing and material recovery, handling, transferring, and disposal facilities at a ULB level. And also, as solid waste management 2016 rules mandate, that waste generated by world waste generators be treated and processed within bigger masses, with residual waste being distributed to local agencies. And also, as it said, that gated communities within over 5,000 square meter of area must partner with local bodies for segregated waste, collection, recycling, and processing of biodegradable waste within their boundaries of the masses. So, therefore, the research or the further um, um, the progress or the way forward can be taken up to research more on retrofitting of solid waste infrastructure in urban residential settlements and uh, how it works in conjunction with existing solid waste management practice. So, this research is going to create this gap. So, so, so basically, uh, there are two things now. Uh, I mean, uh, yes, there is a need of infrastructure at ULB level, and also to think about it, how these existing infrastructure, how these gated communities, where the government of, of, of you know India, uh, with the help of uh, laws 2016, have been mandated that you know whether their premises, either they are bulky generators or either they are gated communities over 5,000 square meter of area, they have to dispose of the wet waste uh, with the premises. So yes, there is a need to understand what kind of infrastructure can be come up with proper guidelines, manuals. And uh, of course, I mean, taking care of environment and and um, um, surroundings. So yes, these are the references I have taken up. And uh, 
And yeah, I mean, thank you. Thanks. Okay, thank you. And uh, we will go to the uh, last one, evaluating the efficacy of biophilic design and achieving sustainable architecture objectives. Uh, let me... Good day, everyone. I'm Dr. Paul Agola. I'm here to present a PowerPoint for the seventh International Conference of Contemporary Affairs in Architecture and Urbanism, taking place in uh, um, in uh, Istanbul, uh, Alaya in Istanbul. Okay. Uh, the title of my presentation is evaluating the efficacy of uh, orphilic design in achieving sustainable architectural objectives. And this is an insight from the expert. I'm presenting on behalf of uh, uh, Professor Orakish Ura Hamad, uh, Dr. Moyem, and uh, Dr. Yiri Dream. In terms of uh, introduction, biophilic design is not mere uh, a trend, but a comprehensive approach in designing spaces that prioritize human well-being, and it reduces environmental impact and contributes to the overall sustainability and resilience of the built environment. Its significance lies in the potential to create environment that nurture both individual and the planet. Therefore, biophilic design incorporates the application of biophilia theory to the field of architecture, city planning, and uh, uh, landscape uh, sustainability. Research gap aim and objectives. Conducting study that consider the unique socioeconomic, cultural, and environmental factors shaping the architectural practice and built environment is the main target of uh, the research area covered by this study. The aim and objectives. The aim is to document the concept and strategies of uh, biophilic design in reaction to the increasing threats to the environment in recent times. Why the objectives of the study focuses on direct impact of effectiveness of biophilic design towards sustainable architecture and the indirect impact of effectiveness of uh, public design towards sustainable architecture. And lastly, we are we try to test the several hypotheses related to the effect of incorporating public design and principle into the urban planning, architecture, and the built environment. The hypothesis generators are one, hypothesis number one, incorporating public design principle into the urban planning and architecture, we improve human aid and well-being as well as the environmental sustainability of the building. And also, we try to test hypothesis two, which state that biophilic design intervention in the built environment will positively influence waste reduction and cycling behavior. And also, hypothesis number three tested I, why the application of biophilic design in urban setting will it imitate will will it mitigate mitigate the urban heat island effect? And number four, will biophilic design principle in architecture positively impact on energy consumption pattern? And lastly, we hypothesis will implementation of the biophilic design strategy in urban species contribute to the increased biodiversity? Materials and method. We employ a mixed method study where we uh, make use of both quantitative and qualitative data connection and analysis method. So various factors of biophilic design strategies were extracted from literature and were consequently viewed by the respondents who are the expert and the professionals via online survey questionnaire and also we always we also uh, adopted a focus uh, group session where we you know seek the opinion of the uh, interviews 
The quantitative research analysis method adopted was the relative, uh, relative important in index. That is the analysis we adopted and also the mean values for appropriating rating as well as, previ as previously utilized by previous studies. Result. The demographic uh, results were presented on uh, this page where we have the gendered marital status, the age level, academic qualification of the respondent, the professional affiliations, family income, years of experience, and uh, familiarity with the biophilic design. Results. In terms of direct impact of effectiveness of biophilic design towards uh, sustainable architecture, the most significant factors that has the highest percentage goes to uh, increased uh, connection to nature, which has 55.56%. And this was followed by uh, increased occupants webbing and also enhance biodiversity. These are the highest percentage of the uh, analysis of the impact of direct effective uh, effectiveness of biophilic design towards sustainable architecture. Also, in terms of indirect effect, we have the highest uh, percentage that goes to enhance well-being with the uh, total value of 49.74%. And this is followed by the greater uh, greater creativity and innovation, and also improved social interaction. These are the percentage of the uh, relative uh, importance in this in relation to the indirect benefit. Then in terms of the tested hypothesis, all our hypotheses were uh, positive. They were supported. Both hypotheses one to four were uh, supported in this uh, uh, research. This question, the indirect impact of the effectiveness of biophilic design towards uh, sustainable architecture, this suggests that the stakeholder value strategies, strategies that integrate green space and promote diversity, biodiversity in this study. And also the biophilic design, which involves the inclusion of natural uh, elements in building and species enhances the human nature connection, thereby supporting environmental and psychological benefit. Finding also emphasize the need of holistic approach to sustainable building design and management. The indirect impact of uh, effectiveness of biophilic design towards the sustainable architectures reveal that uh, the stakeholders can contribute to creating more livable more livable, sustainable, and resilient uh, cities, and also the communities. The comprehensive strategy ensures that human environment are not only economically viable, but also enhances the quality of the living. Incorporating perfectly design principle also reveals that the, the result also reveals that integrating perfectly design into urban and architectural design can yield positive outcomes in several key areas, which includes one, encouraging the an integration of natural element and connection to nature within the urban spaces, and also to enhance physical and mental health for the resident and the well users. And the buffalo design positively, positively influences environmental sustainability by reducing waste and energy consumption. So this um, demonstrates the potential for biophilic inter intervention in supporting sustainable urban development. This will able to mitigate environmental impact. Conclusion and uh, the contribution of the study. These studies findings contribute significantly to the understanding of biophilics, uh, biophilic design potential to enhance sustainable architecture. This provide the framework for the architect and developers, as well as the poly policymakers, to incorporate biophilic design and strategies into their project, and thereby, thereby demonstrating several benefits, which in include improving air quality, reduce reduction in the stress level, increase produ productivity, and enhance aesthetics and reduce energy consumption. To encourage the adoption of biophilic design in Nigerian virtual environment, 
The study recommends raising awareness among its benefits, fostering stakeholder collaboration, considering local uh, context, and evaluating the effectiveness of biophilic strategies. These measures can enhance the quality of life for occupants, as well as promoting sustainability and reconnecting people with nature. Thanks for listening and bye for now. Thank you. Uh, hello again. I think this is the time for the uh, round table too. So if you have uh, any questions, you can ask right now for the uh, people who presented their uh, research. Yeah, Any, anyone to ask, to ask about the, uh, the research that you have covered so far? Okay, uh, if there's no question, I have one question which is related to uh, research one, Dr. Noor. Um, yes. yes, hi. Uh, hi. Hi, Dr. Noor. Uh, my, my question is, uh, you were talking about uh, sustainability in hospitals, and recently we have heard a lot about healing space, healing spaces, and healing uh, through the space, the architecture space, the, like this thing. So my question is, while you are talking about uh, uh, hospitals, my question is, how can uh, hospitals incorporate sustainable practices and materials in their interior design? Yani, uh, to create healing environment. This is also environmentally friendly. So how can we combine between these two healing environment, healing space and environmentally friendly materials and spaces? Because, yes. yeah, 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 yes, go please. Uh, it's, it's a very good question because yani, people will see, see hospitals as, you know, I'm, I'm going to go and get a treatment and come out. But honestly, it's more than that. It, it should be, um, I don't know if you've heard about the Maggie Centers um, for, for cancer care. There are these specialized buildings that are made targeted for cancer patients. And yeah. uh, their their ethos is having an internal environments that yani, make you... Um, <clears throat> Look at life from a different perspective, let's say. So by the use of color, by the use of uh, lighting, there are a lot of studies about how different colors can um, react in the brain um, in certain ways to make you feel more calmer or relaxed. Um, there are different um, textures that could be used as well. So having a tactile environment, it's playing with the senses uh, mostly. Um, with regards to sustainability, so the focus of the research was more about raising awareness that the, the hospital or, or a healthcare building is more than just providing care for patients. It's also caring for the environment. So it's, it's kind of this metaphor that plays having the environment hand in hand with the health of people, the health of the planet. So it's, it's creating this awareness that technology sometimes is not enough purely to move towards sustainability, but it's also about training people to have that mentality about change coming from, from the locality as well and from our actions, from simple acts of recycling, of turning off lights, um, giving initiatives to people who are working in healthcare environments to turn off the HVAC if it's, if it's not in, in use, you know, not having it running 24 seven, uh, not uh, having the lights on 24 seven when, when the building isn't uh, used in certain areas. So it's just having this holistic approach of approaching sustainability yeah. from, from all angles. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Noor. But, uh, you know, my question was, uh, it was between your research and the fourth research, which was uh, uh, Dr. Agbola, which was talking about the biophilic. I am really curious about to understand how we can, uh, this is maybe Dr. Agbola, maybe you can answer this question. How can we, because in your research, we found that the biophilic elements uh, Coming close to the nature was one of the most demand uh, factors asked by the people, required by the people. So how can we, we incorporate those elements in uh, a building like a hospital? Because I, I'm also interested in healthcare building. And normally I see that the, the, especially the healthcare buildings, the hospitals are just very rigid buildings. And people think about uh, 
about the, that the hospital should be 100% uh, limited in function. So when it comes to hospital, يعني, it is very difficult to deal with the materials, with deal with the elements of the design uh, within it. So my question is, how can we incorporate biophilic in hospital to create a healing space? Hello, good. Uh, hello, yeah, hello, hello, everyone. Yeah. Okay, can hello. you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think this is uh, this is uh, a simple uh, approach, like I stated in my research. Uh, one uh, during the design stage, I think we, the architect, the professional, should be conscious of all this. Yeah. Uh, planting green spaces in the in the uh, hospital environment, you know, general planning incorporating some green spaces um, and uh, the nature who one way or the other you know increase the 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 health of the of the patient you know during the, the during their period or probably when they were you know uh, recuperating if we allow them to you know to have a kind of if we allow the environment to have some green status you know some green spaces and i think this who help a lot. Then also the way we design the hospital in recent times, I think should, should we be able to 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 uh, I mean improve the health care uh, and the recovery of the patient. I think these are very important. So like we suggested in our research. So one, I'm, I was talking about having a green spaces because you know in recent times you discover we don't have a, a, a professional search. We don't put much effort in this. So if we can do appropriate landscaping, appropriate provide a provision of appropriate green spaces and the likes, this we one way or the other, you know, improve the health of the you know the, the patient. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, thank you, doctor. Uh, I think it's time is up. So thank you for being here, and I'm gonna to leave you right now, and I will give the. Uh, uh space to dr rossi good Omar morning rossi. yeah good morning i'm here yeah 